Hello, Angela. I'm Dr. Perovich. I'm with the Stroke Team. How are you today? I'm good. Today we're going to do an advanced neurological assessment where I'll have you answer some simple questions and follow some simple commands. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, let's go. The first thing we want to do is assess the level of consciousness. And we can ask some objective questions here. Tell me your first name. Angela. And can you tell me what city we're in? Tucson. And can you tell me the current month and year? May 2019. And can you tell me the name of this place? Benner Hospital Neurology Department. Excellent. Now, it's important for her to answer these questions without looking at the whiteboard in the room. And remember, you might have a patient who's disoriented and confused, who's not able to answer questions or follow commands. You might have an excessively sleepy or, or drowsy patient. Uh, or worse yet, a patient who's stuporous and minimally responsive. Lucky for us, Angela is fully alert and oriented. Next, we want to assess for any subjective symptoms that cannot be readily tested. So Angela, can you tell me, are you having any dizziness or headache? No. Are you having any tingling or nausea? No. Remember, when it comes to communication, keep in mind that language and speech are not the same. Language is a series of words and symbols used to convey a meaning, whereas speech is simply the sound of a spoken language. We can assess language very easily using three different parameters. That's fluency, comprehension, and repetition. So, Angela, can you read this sentence for me? They heard him speak on the radio last night. Excellent. Now, can you show me two fingers with your right hand? Good. Can you repeat the following sentence? The cat always hid under the couch when dogs were in the room. The cat always hid under the couch when dogs are in the room. Excellent. So by testing these three parameters, we can pick up on most of the commonly seen aphasias. Remember, in the intubated patient, they might not be able to speak, or they might not be able to repeat, but they may be able to follow your commands. And of course, we were listening to Angela's articulation and her speech, which was not slurred, uh, was not mumbled or garbled. So if it were, we would call that dysarthria. Now remember, in psychiatric patients, they might have rapid or pressured speech, and in some neurologic conditions, you can see very slowed or very soft speech. Next, we assess the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a neurological and numerical objective scale to measure a patient's level of consciousness by testing three domains, eye opening, verbal response, and motor response. Remember, the maximum score on the Glasgow Coma Scale is a 15, whereas the minimum score is a 3, not a 0. So Angela is obviously opening her eyes spontaneously as we're communicating, so she scores a maximum score of 4 in that category. Now, if she was only opening her eyes to pain or not opening her eyes at all, she might score a 2 or a 1, respectively. Uh, again, uh, she is able to speak to us fluently and coherently, so she would score a maximum of five in the verbal category. Now, if she were confused and uh, not following commands and disoriented, she might score a four. If she were to be using incomprehensible sounds, that would give her a score of two, for example. And lastly, uh, her motor response is a maximum of six because she's able to move all her extremities fluently and spontaneously. Now, if I were to pinch her nail on the left arm and she could localize the pain, she would swap me away. And for that, she would score a five. Now, if I were to pinch her nail and she withdrew from the pain, that would give her a score of four. Now, if I were to pinch her toe, for example, and she were to flex her arms, or what we call decorticate posture, that would score a three. And if she were to extend her arms, in a decerebrate posture, she'd get a score of two. And again, if she had no response to any painful stimuli, she would score a one.
Next, we want to assess the pupils. And what we're looking for here is symmetry, shape, size, and reactivity. Remember, in severe traumatic brain injury, you might see one pupil that's significantly larger or non-reactive compared to the other pupil. That can be an ominous sign of something dangerous. Remember, in adults, uh, the normal pupil size ranges anywhere from two to four millimeters. And uh, it helps to use a pen light with a pupil gauge um, to kind of help you with your measurements. So what we'll do is shine light directly into one eye and we can use our hand to block the light from entering the other eye. And we're assessing for both the direct and consensual response. You might have to do this several times or look closely depending on the lighting in your room. Keep in mind that pinpoint pupils or severely dilated pupils can give you a clue as to what's happening with the patient. The cranial nerves, there's 12 of them. They're very easy to test and most of them can even be tested in the comatose patient. So cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve responsible for our sense of smell. So this can easily be tested by holding an object such as an alcohol swab or a nice hot cappuccino, if you happen to have one, and have the patient close their eyes and try and identify the scent. Alcohol? Correct. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve responsible for vision, and we're testing both our visual acuity and our peripheral fields. So what you want to do is actually stand directly in line with the patient, have them cover one eye, and focus on some central object in your visual field, for example, my, my nose, or maybe an object behind me. And with looking at my nose, I want you to tell me how many fingers can, I, can you see that I'm holding up? Two. Good. And then what you want to do is use your index fingers off to her peripheral field and wiggle one or both of them and ask them which one moved? Both. Excellent. And you would do this by covering the other eye, and then testing both eyes open. Now on to cranial nerves three, four, and six. These are the nerves responsible for eye movements, and they are commonly tested together. So the way you want to do this is grab an external object. Remember, have the patient keep their head straight, and without moving their head, just to track the object with their eyes, starting from the midpoint, laterally to one side, vertically up and then down and then back across the midline again to the opposite side up and then down in the shape of an H. While you're doing this you want to ask the patient are you having any double vision? No. And that would be called diplopia. You also want to look for any drooping of the upper eyelid something called ptosis and uh, you also want to look for nystagmus which is involuntary movement or beating of the eye. The last thing you want to check for is convergence. And again, while focusing on the object, the patient should be able to track it close to their face with their eyes rotating inwards while focusing on the close object. Keep in mind that cranial nerves four and six are not reliably tested in the comatose patient, but that cranial nerves two and three can easily be tested using the pupillary light reflex that we saw earlier. Now we'll go on to cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, responsible for sensation in the face and the jaw muscles for chewing. So we can test this very easily by touching the patient lightly on her forehead and then on her cheeks and then on her chin. And we ask, does it feel the same on both sides? Yes. Excellent. And can you move your jaw to the left and right like this? Good. In a comatose patient who's not able to answer these questions, you can test cranial nerve 5 and 7 actually with the corneal reflex. And all this is is applying a drop of saline onto the cornea and looking for the appropriate blink response. Moving on to cranial nerve 7, that's our facial nerve. Now this nerve is responsible for all the movements and facial expressions that we have. So Angela, can you please wrinkle your forehead and raise your eyebrows? Good. Now I want you to close your eyes really tight. That's good. And open your eyes. Now, depending on what kind of mood you're in, please smile or grimace for us. 
And what you're looking for here is symmetry in the face. Cranial nerve eight is our nerve responsible for hearing. And probably we've already tested it by this point, but another way you can test it is to simply rub your fingers next to one ear and then rub the fingers next to the other ear and ask, does that sound the same on both sides? Yes, it's the same. Now, in a comatose patient who can't answer this question, you can test cranial nerve eight using something called the vestibulo-ocular reflex, but that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. Moving on to cranial nerve nine, easily tested by having the patient open their mouth, stick out their tongue, and say, ah, ah. And what you wanna look for here is symmetry of the soft palate and a midline position of the uvula. Now remember, cranial nerve 10 is not independently tested, but is actually tested in conjunction with cranial nerve 9 via the gag reflex. And in a comatose or intubated patient, we can do this by endotracheal suction. Cranial nerve 11, responsible for head and neck movements. Again, very easy to test. So we'll have you just shrug your shoulders. Excellent, and relax. Now I want you to move your head to the left. Good, and then turn your head to the right. That's excellent. Um, this one would be difficult to test in a comatose or intubated patient. The last cranial nerve is the nerve responsible for tongue movements. Now, this is where things can get a little bit silly, but I want you to stick out your tongue, and I want you to move your tongue to the left, and then move your tongue to the right. Good. Now, you can carry on with whatever tongue twisters you want, but uh, that concludes the cranial nerve assessment. Last but not least is the neuromuscular exam. So before we jump to any strength testing, we want to make some visual observations and just look for any abnormal movements or any tremor. We also want to assess the tone of the muscles in the joints. Again, we'll isolate the joint here and comment on, is it flaccid or limp? Or is it very tight or spastic? Or is it rigid? like a cogwheel. Okay, and you can relax. Now, I'll have you squeeze my hand. You wanna test the hand grip. Excellent. And let's have you flex your elbow. And with the elbow flexed and isolating the shol shoulder, we'll have you pull towards you. Good. And now push away. Excellent. And you also want to test the ankles and feet. So let's have you push up against my hand with your foot and ankle. Good. And then you want to push down like a gas pedal. And these are some simple tests um, to check the strength of some of the common joints. Remember, for strength, a five is full strength. Four would be strength to resistance. A three would be strength to gravity, but not resistance. A two is movement with gravity eliminated or movement along the plane of the bed. A one would be minimal contraction without significant movement. And then of course a zero would be no movement at all. The next thing we wanna look at is something called pronator drift. So we'll have you extend both arms, turn the palms facing up, and then close your eyes and keep your hands in this position and we wanna see the patient be able to maintain this position. Now, if the hand or forearm starts to turn inwards like so, or it starts to drift down, this would be a positive test for pronator drift, and you can relax. Also part of the neuromuscular exam is testing for sensation. Again, very easily done by touching both sides of the patient and asking them, does it feel the same on both sides? Yes. And we do the same thing in the legs with light touch. Does it feel the same on both sides? Yes. The last test is for ataxia. Now, what you wanna do here is stand about arm's length from the patient and hold your index finger in front of the patient's visual field. And with their index finger, have them touch the tip of your index finger and touch the tip of their nose and go back and forth in a smooth, continuous motion. That's excellent. Now she should be able to do this with both sides without any impaired coordination or without missing the target, unless there is any ataxia. Similarly, in the lower extremity, 
the way to test for ataxia is to take the heel of one foot and bring it up to the knee of the other leg and slide it down along the top of the shin down to the ankle and then back up to the knee. And they should be able to do this in a continuous and smooth repetitive fashion. If it's incoordinated or the heel is falling off of the top of the shin, then that would be ataxia. And that concludes the advanced neurological assessment. Thank you.